Yeah, I'll give you a few minutes. And I, I'm sitting now at Jim's desk in the in his office. I'm giving you all the inside information here. Um, <laughs> I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, what do I do? So I rang my dad. Hey guys, it's me, Isha. Welcome back to my channel. I'm really looking forward to sharing this video with you. Coming right up is 10 questions with Gavin Peacock. Now, Toon fans watching will agree that we as a fan base, we have a special connection with Gavin. He played for Newcastle in the early 90s for three memorable years. After that, he went on to play for Chelsea, QPR and Charleston Athletic. On Tyneside, he made 120 appearances and he scored 46 goals. I'm sure he's full of interesting stories. So I can't wait to get into conversation with him. Do subscribe for more content like this and let's get into it. Gavin, thank you so much for joining me. How are you? Very well, thanks, Cisha. Very well. It's a pleasure to have you on and we're going to jump straight into these questions. The first one, we're rewinding back to your early days. Can you remember your first ever Newcastle kit? What do you remember about it? Why was it so special? Well, I do remember my first kit and it was actually, I wore it uh, a long time before I actually played for the, for the first team. Um, and I was living down south in, in, in the London area. Um, and my dad bought me a, a Newcastle kit when I was about six, I, I would have said six or seven years old. Uh, the reason that uh, I got a Newcastle kit and not, a, not even a Charlton Athletic kit, because my dad was a professional footballer for Charlton Athletic, but the reason I got a Newcastle kit is uh, my dad's dad, my, my, my granddad Tom and, and, and my nan, they're all from the northeast, uh, from Newcastle. So all Newcastle fans, and my dad was a Newcastle fan, and, um, and so that was the kit I got. Um, and I have even got a, a photograph of when I'm young. Uh, we used to go visit cousins and, and what have you up in the northeast. I've got a photograph when I was young, just uh, playing football, or just a team photo with my cousins there, and I'm. I'm proud as punch in the front row with the Newcastle kit. Couldn't have even imagined that I would have played for the club and captain the team all those years later. Brilliant. Well, like you said, your dad was a professional footballer. I understand that you always wanted to follow in his footsteps. So can you remember what your earliest dreams were as an aspiring footballer? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I was brought up uh, kind of around the smell of the dressing room. I went to the Valley uh, to watch my dad uh, play and to train and so uh, whenever I, it was school holidays I was down there and I, I saw that I knew the Charlton players and they'd have little chats with me I, I watched them train I, as I say I watched my dad play on a on a weekend and uh, he was captain of Charlton and and add to that the, the fact that he he was a great dad but also a great coach and he would you know be in the back garden with me and and give me little skills to do and, and teach me how to control the ball and move with the ball and and so from an early age, it was modeled for me. I was never pressured to do it, but it was modeled for me. And I just grew in this desire with, with a great role model uh, and the advantage of having a dad who was present with me and, and poured into, into my life and gave me good advice, um, that this just desire to follow in his footsteps just grew from, from a young age. And I just played, I just went through the ranks like normal kids, ended up playing for my school team when I was about seven or eight and then district and then county and uh, English schoolboys when I was 15 and then signed professional after that. Okay and like you said when you were really young wearing your Newcastle kit you could mm. never have imagined that you'd actually reach that milestone of playing for the club yet when mm. you were at Bournemouth the call did actually come through from Newcastle. Can you yeah. remember the the conversation you had with Harry Redknapp about that call? Yeah um, Bournemouth uh, would, had been a, a good move for, for me um, in as much as they bought me from, from Gillingham. It was a club record fee, it was about 250 grand. And, um, but we got relegated and I was, you know, I was wanting to hit the heights and go back up. And so I'd chatted to Harry a little bit um, about my desire to, to leave if a bigger club came in. And um, we, we started the so I was in my second season at Bournemouth. This was 1990. We started the season um, and I was playing quite well, enjoying life on the South Coast, been married a year. Um, and then Harry was just, I saw Harry on the phone uh, 
on the sort of sidelines of training one day and he kept glancing over at me and and then after training he came across and he said Gavin Newcastle United have, have come in for you uh, and I just didn't really hear much else than that but just I just knew that was the that was the big move that was the club and to be Newcastle as well went home to my wife we just bought a nice little house our first house and I said to her, you know, I have to take the move. And she just like, burst into tears and said, where's Newcastle? And I said, it's up north and it's cold, but it's a big club and we're going to go. And so that was the, uh, that was the big move. All right. And before we move on to that move, just speaking about Harry Redknapp, how would you describe your experience being managed by him? Harry was a, br a brilliant manager. You know, as, as most people, I think people see him and, you know, celebrity, get me out of here. And, you know, he's, He's king of the jungle and all of this. That, but his personality, that is him. Uh, that's really? him around the training ground. Yeah, he's just uh, just out there, genuine, he's enthusiastic, great uh, motivator of men, um, can spot a good player, and his team's always played football the way it should be played. And so for, for the year or so I was with Harry, um, I really enjoyed playing for him. And I think, you know, I became a better player under him. Um, I was there as well when, um, you, you may or may not remember, the 1990 World Cup in Italy, Harry Redknapp was in a serious car crash and uh, he was in hospital in intensive care out there um, for, I don't know, a couple of weeks and it was touch or go and, uh, and he survived that and came back and obviously went on to great things in football. So just shows the character of the man as well. Yeah, a true fighter. So you're on your way to Newcastle, 23 years old. You signed midweek, but your first game was on the Saturday itself. It was 1st of December, 1990. So can you describe your feeling in, in that week? Yeah, I, I can. I remember I remember going up um, to, to sign and uh, Jim Smith was the manager. Now, Jim Smith had given me my debut uh, as a 19 year old for QPR when he was manager of QPR several years earlier and that we were in the top division then. So he obviously kind of liked me as a player, kept tabs on me and uh, now a few years on, uh, he wanted to sign me. And I, my dad, I never had an agent. My dad acted as my agent and that was great. Really? Yeah, and he acted, you know, just because he knew all the managers in the game and he was always going to act to my best interest. So I'd take my dad along with me to to do negotiations and well what happened is uh, we drove up to uh, Nottingham because Newcastle were playing Knott's Forest at midweek game and we were we met Jim in the hotel before the game we did the the deal uh, uh, you know agreed terms and then I was watched the game and then I traveled back up with the team uh, on the team bus um, to sign the contract at the, the St James's Park the next day with a couple of days before the first game on the Saturday. When I, I stayed at Jim Smith's house overnight, he took me into the main ground in the morning and uh, I'm in Jim's office and he came in, he looks, face looks a bit serious, he says, oh, I've just spoken to the board and they think I've, uh, we've offered you too much money. Uh, <laughs> three, yeah. He said, I've, I've, off I've offered you too much money. Um, he said, that we're gonna have to reduce the terms. And I was like, yeah, you know, not even 20, well, just turned 23. I'm up there, big club, and I'm thinking, I've probably, you know, uh, they think we get the young lad in the stadium, he'll just sign for peanuts and that's it. And your dad wasn't there at this point, right? Dad wasn't there. So I ring oh. my dad, he said, I'll give you a few minutes. And I, I'm sitting now at Jim's desk in the in his office. I'm giving you all the inside information here. Um, <laughs> I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, what do I do? So I rang my dad. By this time, I, my father was, uh, was a manager for uh, probably, I think it was Mason United then. Well, he was he was out on the training ground, couldn't get hold of him. So I called Brendan Batson at the PFA and uh, said, Brendan, this is the situation. What do you think I should do? And, you know, he said, well, you know, you could try for more money, but I don't think they, they'll, you know, they'll agree to it. I said, what about if I, I say, I won't sign a three-year deal, I'll sign an 18 month deal on the reduced terms, but I'll be renegotiating again in a year. He said, well, that's a big risk. He said, if you do great, it's the best contract you've signed. If you do bad and you get injured, you're in, you're in trouble. He said, they'll never go for it. Not 18 months, not when they pay good money for you. So anyway, I put the phone down, Jim came back in. I said, all right, I'll sign for slightly less, but only for 18 months. 
He said, done, deal done. Didn't even think about it. And I signed that, JT, and I'd done great for Newcastle in that year. And it was, it was probably, I always say, best contract I ever signed. Um, and that was three days before my debut. Um, so I then was out on the training ground, yeah, getting ready for the game. Uh, and uh, Jim put me straight in the starting line up for Leicester away. So what did your dad say after you had revealed to him this negotiation you had done without him? Oh, yeah. I mean, he, he I don't think he could believe it when I was I told him. Um, <laughs> but again, you know, a risk. But I was young. I thought I could do well at Newcastle. Um, and uh, I thought, hey, you know, a, a year later I'll be, and I'll be renegotiating for a better deal, a longer deal. Um, and if it goes badly, maybe I won't want to be there anyway. But uh but yeah, so he was fine with it, and uh, and then after that, I was just excited to to uh, to play. I'd been given a tour of the stadium by Ray Ransom, who was an older pro at the Newcastle at the time, very experienced, and and he said to me, "This is just before I signed the contract." He said, "Just sign for this club," he said, "because it's big." He said, "And if it takes off, you want to be on this on this ride here." So, so he gave you the tour of St James's Park, but. How did that compare to your first home game? And what were your expectations going into that? Yeah, I mean, obviously Leicester was away. And then, you know, I had, uh, I think I may, got, may have got um, a slight knock or a sickness. I was supposed to play the next week, didn't play the week after. But yeah, St. James's Park was just, bear in mind, I'd, I'd come from Bournemouth. So, you know, the difference was just huge when you walked out of St. James's Park. And even though Newcastle were, Mid-table, still in the third round of the FA Cup though, uh, the crowd was still vociferous and the pressure, the pressure was on. So we, we had big players, uh, Mick Quinn and Mark McGee and Roy Aitken, Scotland's captain, and, uh, and they were feeling the pressure. I actually didn't feel the pressure because I was young and, you know, I just come and I don't think the fans really expected too much of me. You know, they didn't really know me too well. Um, but uh, I went out there and uh, did okay. And uh, I think it was only a week or so later I scored my first goal away at Plymouth. So I got off to a good start with the crowd and, um, and, and, and they, they had a good relationship with me the whole time I was there. So let's move on to the final day of the 91-92 season. The team travelled to Leicester and Newcastle were on the brink of relegation to the third division, which would have been the first time in history of the club. Now, the pressure was obviously on, but how did you handle that pressure, given that you have that sentimental connection with the club? It wasn't just the club you played for, it was your boyhood club. Uh, I mean, it was a very emotional day. And as well, I'd made my debut uh, at Filbert Street uh, for Newcastle, you know, 18 months earlier. Uh, the pressure was absolutely huge. Uh, I've got family in the Northeast as well, still, that were supporting the team. My, and I always just remember my, gra my granddad Tom's words. My, my granddad died uh, in the uh, sort of mid 90s, um, a couple of two or three years after that day. Um, and he said, "Listen, the day I signed for the club, he said, if he said if you sweat blood for their team, he said the Geordie fans will forgive you many mistakes on the field." Um, he said, but they got to see that you will die for their team because if they could pull on the shirt, they would. I always remembered that, you know. And I, I walked out that day and, you know, it was really nerve wracking in the dressing room because we were feeling all of that pressure. We had a, a five, 6,000 fans in the corner there that was just out shouting the Leicester fans. There was so much, you know, such passion there. Um, my granddad's words ringing in my ear and, um, and we went out into a, a febrile atmosphere there that was going to decide the fate of the club one way or the other. It would have been hard to come back from going down to the third division with the financial situation and everything. And um, of course, we we ended up getting the right result. And uh, it, it was one of the best days uh, of my football career. Um, I scored uh, first goal. Um, we went 1-0 up. And then uh, their captain, Steve Walsh, equalised with minutes to go. And at this stage, we didn't know whether a point was going to be enough for us to stay up. So we're all looking at the bench, shouting to, to Keegan, what do we do, Gaffer? Do we do we hold on for the point? Do we need to go for the win? And and they didn't know because, you know, mobile phones, all of this kind of stuff, all the data and that, that you know, we can just at the click of a button now have. It wasn't coming through quick. So 
We didn't know. So Tommy Wright, our goalkeeper, got the ball, literally backed him from the kickoff and punted it downfield. I was chasing the defender down. Uh, Steve uh, Walsh, the one that had scored and equalised for, for Leicester, now facing his own goal. I just stretched to poke it and he got there first and touched it past the goalie. Uh, into the back of the net, 2-1, and the crowd just came onto the pitch. Referee blew the whistle. The Leicester fans swarmed onto the pitch. I'm facing them. So I veered away from that crowd into the corner where the Newcastle fans were, and they started to come onto the field. Now I was trapped because there's going to be a big fight, and I'm the furthest part, uh, furthest distance away from the tunnel. So I just turned and hot-heeled it for the tunnel, dodged in between a few fans, and and got out of it, uh, but but we got we got the result and it was great. I gave I my granddad had a stroke um, not long after. I think he, he was actually in hospital, uh, pain. so I took my shirt to him, the number eight that I wore that day, and I gave it to him, and uh, he kept it. And my my dad gave it back to me after my granddad died, and he, he gave it to me in a, in a in a package. He said, "Your granddad never washed that shirt." He said, to the day he died because you sweated blood for his team on the day he saved them from relegation. So that that's is the story. So, so yeah. sweet. It obviously meant a lot for him, to, for you to play in the black and white stripes. And it's such a heartwarming thing for you to remember that giving him the shirt, what it meant to him. And just to carry that story with you and connect it with your Newcastle career is really lovely. Fans can connect to that because they, or every Newcastle fan will feel the same way. Exactly. That's what I was going to say. And you, you do seem to have this special connection with the fan base, with those sort of personal touches to your own upbringing, your own Geordie roots. And you played under three managers whilst you are at Newcastle, the third being Kevin Keegan, of course. And I read somewhere that you had posters of him in your bedroom when you were younger. So how did it feel when you heard the news that he was heading Tyneside? Yeah, I think I see you've got a book of his behind you as well there on your... Uh, Best on your book show. ever. I love this. I, I feel like reading this book, I can actually... I've never been able to meet him, but even reading that book, I just sort of get glimpses of what he's like as a person because he seems to, like, write how he talks, if you know what I mean. Yeah, no, he was... He was I mean, as you say, posters, you know, on, on my bedroom wall of, of Kevin Keegan and, and Glenn Hoddle, funny that I played for Glenn as well. Uh, and uh, and I, I, Ozzy Ardiles has been manager and he got the sack and, you know, we were very sad. O Ozzy was a, a, was a great man, a fantastic player, obviously, but a wonderful man who brought a lot of the young players through and really encouraged uh, the youngsters. But we were just leaking too many goals. And in the end, he got sacked. So it was a sad day. And I was driving away thinking, you know, what's, what's going to happen now? Because when a, when a manager gets sacked, um, it affects everyone at the training ground, everyone at the club, it's instability. And the players are thinking, well, the new guy that come in, fancy me, would, I could be on my way, you know, um, what's going to happen? And I, I just remember listening to the radio and hearing we've signed Kevin Keegan. Yeah. I was, I think I was going over the time bridge at the time and uh, I thought that's the one. Um, <laughs> obviously been one of England's first real superstars, you know, world superstars. He'd gone to SV Hamburg in Germany, won European Footballer of the Year twice. He was one of football's first millionaires that could retire, literally retire, when he finished playing football. Most footballers were having to get a job, you know, uh, outside football or coaching or are they owned a pub or a sports shop? No, this was Keegan could retire, went to Marbella, lived there for seven years playing golf. And uh, then he, he literally comes back from this retirement at, to St. James's Park, pulled us on the first training session the next day. And he said, listen, and he's, you know, he's not, he's not a tall guy, but he fills the room with his presence. Like kind of you were saying in the book, you know, just it comes out of him. And he said, uh, he said, listen, he said, if any of you wants to leave this football club, come and see me now. He said, and I'll arrange what I can do to get you away. He said, but if you want to stay, give me everything. He said, this club will survive this season and then watch us take off. And, and that first speech really was the, was the driving force for the next sort of 18 months because he made that come true. He literally made that come true at the, at the club through sheer personality and, and wise purchases, getting the, a, a good team together in his second season, which ran away with the, with, with the old first division to get us into the Premier League. Wow. 
it's just magnificent what he was able to achieve. Like I said, in the book, it really goes into the detail of like the dressing room with you guys and then the media and then the public spats. And it truly is astonishing what he was able to achieve in a relatively short space of time. So I always like hearing from the other end how you guys felt about it. And it, it seems like you guys had the belief in him. Like, you know, anyone can just come in and say, we're going to achieve this, that and the other. But you guys had the belief and he took you through that. So that's really cool to hear. You finished your Newcastle career with 46 goals, 120 appearances. And I think you made those early 90s tune memories. They're sort of memories that we'll cherish, cherish for a really long time. What would you say is your most memorable fan moment? Or was there ever a point where you were like, whoa, I actually really mean a lot to this fan base? Um, so many memories of fans. You know, I still will have messages with fans from back in the, in the day at Newcastle and fans would wait for me afterwards. I remember, you know, a uh, guy called John Shearer, he would wait outside. He, in the freezing cold for me for hour, hour and a half, just to say hi and have a program signed. I'd get him a ticket if I could, and he would love oh. to carry my wash bag to the car for me. And, you know, do anything. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, then there was, a, there was a fan called Stevie Charlton. He's, he's known uh, amongst Newcastle fans. He's, he died now. But there's a picture when we won promotion to the Premier League of me and Rob Lee carrying the trophy around the pitch. And all the players, Andy Cole's in the picture, different players are there. Um, the fans at the Gallagher Gate End are in the background. And Stevie Charlton's just behind me and Rob Lee. And it's almost like the light is actually reflecting off the trophy onto Stevie. And, <laughs> and it comes, it's like, oh, it's, yeah, the players and the trophy, but this fan is what it's all about, representing the whole, you know? Wow. Um, and he, he would stand, stand out there. He, um, he'd been there since he was a kid. He'd sold peanuts on, you know, outside the ground. He was a, he was an orphan. Newcastle was his family. And uh, he was an old, he was in his sixties when we won promotion. And, you know, Keegan would come out, give him a kiss every home game, give him a little boiled sweet, little sort of routines like that. And uh, so I think, you know, Stevie probably sort of encapsulated the heart of, of those Newcastle fans who is, it, 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 it's more than it's more than just football. It's about a, a club, a community, uh, the, the feeling of togetherness, the hope that you can have, and your team on a Saturday, um, and that sense of belonging. You know, and you know, so Stevie Charlton was a was a great guy. Brilliant, Gavin. Thank you so much for speaking to us. I really, really appreciate all this insight. Thank you. No problem. It's a real pleasure. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. Make sure you like it, subscribe to the channel for more content and I'll see you lot soon. Thanks for watching.